excited. Um, so my name is Tanya. I've been with our studio for about two years now. Um, so I work in customer success. Um, so I work with several of our enterprise customers. Um, my background is as a therapist, so that was my first career. Um, and so uh, I started to see these principles of resiliency in some of my strongest R champions. And so I wanted to take some time to talk through um, what an R champion is, how you can improve your R championing. Is that a word? I think it is. Yeah, um, R championing and some of the barriers and some of the ways that I've seen folks be successful in overcoming those barriers. Um, so who is an R champion? Well. Probably a lot of you here are our champions. Um, but these are some ideas that I came up with as I was thinking about um, what an R champion is. So um, an R champion is someone who uses R to accomplish the core goals and objectives of their job, um, promotes the use of R within their group and broader ecosystem that they live in. Um, they contribute to the R community through um, R Studio community and Stack Overflow and other mediums. Um, advocates for and takes ownership of our tooling in their environment. Um, so uh, one of the things that I'll talk a little bit more about later on is that um, sometimes what I see is that R is installed and left to IT to manage. Um, and the teams that I see be the most successful are when a data scientist is really driving their R tool chain forward. Um, and then uh, an R champion is also someone who stays up to date on all things R and freely disseminates this information. So within their group at work, but also through other mediums. So through community, through, um, through R meetups and other channels. So I wanted to add in this slide for simple ideas to improve your R champion cred. Um, so one easy one is to organize a lunch and learn for just our analysts or maybe analysts interested in R in your group. Uh, and then once you get this off the ground with your friends, invite more friends from parallel groups. So how do you get a hold of them? Um, start an internal Slack channel. So for folks in your broader organization that um, are using R. So I saw this be really successful in one of my accounts where there were several, several different branches um, that were all technically different orgs but under one broader org. And they started a Slack channel for just the, for all the different branches, even though they're technically different companies under the same parent company. Um, and it was really successful because when someone ran into a problem with their R code, they could rely on their colleague, their broader colleagues in their bigger ecosystem um, for help. Be intentional about connecting with other R users at R meetups and R conferences, and talk about the barriers that you're running into, because chances are you're not alone. It can, when you run into a, a barrier, or someone says no to something that you want to do, chances are you're, it can feel very isolative, but chances are you're not alone. Someone else has run into that. So talk about you know, the 50,000 foot view of how things are going in your organizations with other R users. So what are some of the barriers? <laughs> now that I got you all stoked about being an uh, uh, R champion, what are some of the barriers that you might run into? So these are definitely not all of the barriers, uh, but this is a short talk, so I can't go through all of them. Um, so these are just a few of the ones that I came up with. So some of the ones that I see are the open source mentality. Um, so that was kind of twofold. Uh, why should we trust open source tools, and why should we pay for open source tools? Um, uh, funding issues, there's not enough money, IT support, and then, of course, internal political pressure, everyone's favorite. Um, so why, <laughs> why trust um, open source R? So one of the things that I've, I've learned a lot about in my role is, a, is the, different, um, the different mentality. So um, the old school thought before open source became, you know, being became utilized in enterprise settings was that you buy your software from a big company that wrote the software, um, and then you have to pay for support to support that software. Um, and uh, I don't know if you've ever bought a software from a, a big company and then had it not function as you anticipated. Um, and it's hard to really validate that because it's, it's closed source, right? You cannot see the source code. You can't validate for yourself that the software will, the software will perform as anticipated. Um, so 
active software utilization is more the open source mentality. The code is all there, and you have to, or you can go in, look at the software, look at the code, and make sure it'll do what you need it to do. And I will say it's a little bit higher investment with the active software utilization. So that's sometimes where you get some resistance is the fact that it does, you're, you're taking ownership of it and you're validating it yourself. Um, so uh, the nice thing about that though is open source technology, it's really hard to hide faulty software. There's kind of nowhere to hide. Your source code is out there. If it doesn't work, you're gonna find out really quickly and the community is not gonna be happy. Um, so that's another big benefit is that, um, is that you can validate your, your own software. It is a higher investment, though. Um, so there's a strong community for our developers um, and our platform administrators. So we're doing more and more on our studio community to support the IT folks who are, um, who are supporting uh, the platform for analysts. And last but not least, sometimes you can run into issues with your legal team or your info security team. Um, and there is commercially licensed R and tools for R available, and sometimes that can help assuage some of the legal concerns um, when you're switching between, or when you're moving more towards an open source software. So, okay, now that you've got the open source software, why should we pay for tooling around that open source software? Um, there's a few different reasons. So, uh, performance. So. I don't know if you've had any experience with the open source tools versus the professional tools, um, but typically you have a little bit better performance, definitely with the server products that we have. Um, you have improved performance. It can be deployed in a more secure fashion. You can have things like authentication, kind of locking it down, and that helps InfoSec uh, feel, uh, feel more, uh, more confident in the tools. And then you can have um, increased collaboration with your colleagues and then with Connect and other tools, you can do some automations. You can um, automate out some reporting. You can do. Uh, you can also have a commercial license, which we kind of talked about before. But you can um, the, you can have some legal coverage, which makes legal happier. Um, you also get maintenance and support, um, and someone uh, like me and support and solutions engineering to give you ideas about how you might want to set up the software and give you suggestions. Um, so that can be really valuable as well. And then there was this idea that Tarif talked about in his keynote yesterday of technology philanthropy. So by investing as an enterprise in uh, enterprise tool chain for R, you're also helping the broader R community and the, and the R Studio community as well. Um, so this is another one that I hear a lot, funding. There's not enough room in the budget. How many people have run into funding barriers? Yeah, yeah, it's really common. This is probably the top one that I hear. Um, so my best advice for coming, overcoming the funding uh, issues is just to create, use the open source tool chain. So really deep dive on creating APIs, creating um, really valuable shiny apps. Show them what's possible. And then um, be able to communicate what else is possible with the, with the tool chain. So um, I like folks to start with the open source tool chain and create a demand uh, for a parameterized R markdown. So really deep dive um, into the open source tool chain, and a lot is actually possible with the open source tools. Um, so collaborate with parallel teams through your R community. So once you've built up an R community, collaborate with those teams. I've seen several teams be successful in collaborating and resource sharing. So um, two different teams and different organizations using one software. Um, that's definitely possible. Or if there is a team in your organization that's been successful with funding, they may know how, they may have ideas for you as to how they got that funding made available to them. And then I kind of covered this in my first point. <laughs> Clearly communicate the possibilities with open source and the possibilities with professional software. So once you have your proof of concept, there are evaluations of all of our professional products that can allow you the opportunity to demonstrate what's possible, what else is possible. Um, and once you create that appetite, I've seen funds become available. All right. Oh, the last one. Ask good questions. So I think sometimes when, uh, when we're told no, the automatic response is, oh. 
Like, you know, and, and, it, and it can be hard to kind of pull yourself together and um, approach that with curiosity. Oh, okay, is, is, is there any um, funding changes in the future uh, that you can see coming down the road? Um, what about our tool chain for next year? Is there gonna be any additional funding? So sometimes just getting over the, oh, and going to approaching it with curiosity uh, can be uh, successful in um, kind of problem solving. And the way I like to think of it is help your manager or whoever, uh, whoever told you no um, uh, solve your problem. So you want to get them bought in. Ask a lot of how, what, open-ended questions um, in a very curious manner because you're really trying to do them a service at this point when you're asking for tooling. No one just asks for tools just to have a bigger toolbox. Um, the other thing that I hear occasionally is uh, from IT, uh, we can't set up uh, something that is free. There needs to be a commitment from the business. Again, asking good questions becomes really, really important here. Um, so what commitment is necessary to use open source tools? What does commitment look like? Can you give me an idea of what that looks like? Um, is there a separate team that manages open source software? Um, so I've had several, um, several of my larger accounts that I will work with. Um, there's the IT team that they always use, and that team says no, and then they don't really know where else to go. But sometimes within your organization, there's a research group that's kind of like a mad science lab where they're deploying different software. Um, and sometimes those mad scientist groups are way more willing to take a chance on open source. Um, and another thing to think about is, you know, they're saying no to R, but I can almost promise you there's Python somewhere. What team is managing Python? Um, like, is there a team for, mani for, for managing open source software? So sometimes it requires a little out of the box thinking to find the right team. All right, let's see, did I get all the points? Yes. Um, oh, yeah, and asking about the specific policies, because sometimes they'll say, no, that's, that's not in, a, in line with our policy. Well, okay, great, what is? Um, so sometimes just you know, going back and asking a good what question can, can be really helpful. There's also a few different options um, from a technical perspective. So we do have um, pre-configured virtual machines on um, all of the major cloud platforms, so AWS, Google Cloud, um, I, I think Azure as of recently. Um, Kelly says yes. OK, good. Thank you, Kelly. <laughs> um, and then, uh, yeah, find those, find those open source policy documents. Yeah, hit that one twice. Really important. Um, and then the last thing is explore external partners. So if you're really kind of spinning your wheels, you can't find anyone in your IT group or your mad scientist IT group that wants to set this up, um, then um, we, do, we can help you find a partner uh, that can come in and set up the server. Um, and sometimes I, I have several folks that will need to do that um, just to get anything done. I'm getting close to time, so I'm going to hurry up. Um, so political pressure for other tools and languages. Um, so not every tool is right for every problem. Um, don't argue for one tool, instead argue for more tools. Uh, again, I, I, I like this idea of curiosity and I've seen it be really successful. Um, so uh, asking about the features that they saw in the product, like what, what is their tangible takeaway that they're interested in? Are they interested in a dashboard? Are they interested in a report? What is the takeaway? And then in the back of your head, be thinking about could I show them something similar with the open source R? Um, so uh, just asking those good questions so that you understand what their needs are, and then you have the, your R skills that you can think about how to create that with, with the tool chain that you prefer. So how does this align with, um, with our goals and needs? So asking about how the software, what direction are we going as a team? And this can be really good for helping, helping you navigate through your career. Um, what other tools are available for me? Um, so if I run into problems, what are my other options? Um, so again, you're kind of recruiting them to help them solve your problem. Um, and so uh, just through curiosity and letting them, uh, letting them uh, telling them kind of what's possible. And then um, more tools is not necessarily bad. You can definitely have too many tools, but um, a toolbox with just a bunch of hammers is not that helpful. Um, in this photo, it would be helpful to have a screwdriver. 
Last but not least, you can do it. I've seen a lot of people run into some really stubborn barriers, and I've seen these concepts work in action. So you can do it. You can advocate for your tool chain, um, and you can be successful using the tools that you prefer to use. All right, questions? Do you see R Studio Connect as a good way to initially get in the door, I guess, with R in an organization? Yeah, definitely. So <clears throat> I think um, R Studio Connect is a great way because of the emailing feature. So every executive that's consuming your reports um, is attached to their inbox. Um, and so if you can show them the automated reporting where they can get their daily reports sent to them at the same time every day, and that can include metadata in the subject title, um, that's a golden way to get buy-in in our Studio Connect. You can even do some really nice HTML um, email formatting so that it looks really great in their inbox. And I think if more executives were able to see that, um, they would get more excited about the R Studio um, professional tool chain, specifically Connect. I didn't catch it with my face. Um, <laughs> do you have any uh, experience working it with public sector agencies where, I mean, I'm from Washington State mm -hmm. and the Department of Health, and Microsoft is kind of a religion there, you know? <coughs> and so mm -hmm. we have all, you know, contracts with all these things, and I'm, you know, trying to slip this stuff mm -hmm. in is more than challenging. Yeah, definitely. So um, we have several folks. So actually, that um, the team that I worked with that had this giant Slack channel, they were actually in the public sector. So there's and uh, the other thing from a legal contracts per perspective, um, you probably know purchasing anything with the government. I mean, like you need like so much. There's so much red tape. Um, but we're doing more in terms of um, contracts, partnering with folks that actually are GS on the GSA schedule and other things that. Um, public sector and government organizations really need. Um, it is possible. Um, there are more barriers and it generally takes longer, but we're doing more and more to um, make it easier to purchase from us. Yeah. 